So let's watch an excerpt from the previous Free Code Camp video so that we can understand what storage is and what it looks like. We're going to look at one of the first and most obvious gas optimization techniques, and it has to do with all of these variables at the top and this thing called storage. So this gas snapshot, we're actually going to write some code to make this test be much more gas efficient. So let's learn about storage so we can learn this gas optimization technique. Let's say we look at the average gas for these and we go, huh, this looks like it's actually a lot more than what we originally expected. Is there a way for us to make this a little bit cheaper? We go back to our fund me contract. We look at our withdrawal function and we notice something. Oh, there is actually a way to make this a lot cheaper. And it has to do with something called storage variables or these global variables that we've been working with this whole time. Let me let me paint you a little picture here. We're going to look at one of the first gas optimization techniques you can take to drop these down. And it has to do within our fund me contract, these state variables and how they're actually stored and how this contract actually keeps track of all this stuff. This section is going to be a little bit more advanced. So we'll have a note here saying that this is an advanced section. And if you want to skip over it, you can, because now we're getting into gas optimizations here. This information still is really good to know. So if you want to skip it for now and then come back later, you absolutely can. But let's talk about what happens when we actually save or store these global variables, aka these storage variables. Now, everything I'm about to go through is in the documentation, and there is a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Whenever we have one of these global variables or these variables that stay permanently, they're stuck in something called storage. You can think of storage as a big giant array or a giant list of all the variables that we actually create. So when we say we have some contract called fund of storage and we have a variable called favorite number, we're basically saying we want this favorite number variable to persist, right? We saw in a lot of our examples, we had a favorite number variable that we could always call to see what this contract's favorite number was. Well, the way it persists is it gets stored in this place called storage. Now storage works as this giant list associated with this contract where every single variable and every single value in this storage section is slotted into a 32 byte long slot in this storage array. So for example, the number 25 in its bytes implementation is 0x00 with a ton of zeros 19. This is the hex version of the UNT256. This is why we do so much hex translation. This is the bytes implementation of a UN256. And each storage slot increments just like an array starting from zero. So for example, our next global variable or our next storage variable just gets slotted at the next slot that's available. So Booleans, for example, get transformed from their bool version to their hex. And we modified our sum bool variable to be true. And the hex addition of the true Boolean is 0x0001. Every time you save an additional global variable, or more correctly, one of these storage variables, it takes up an additional storage slot. And what about variables that are dynamic in length or that can change length? What about something that's dynamic? Well, for dynamic values like a dynamic array or a mapping, elements inside the array or inside the mapping are actually stored using some type of hashing function. And you can see those specific functions in the documentation. The object itself does take up a storage slot, but it's not going to be the entire array. For example, my array variable here at storage slot two doesn't have the entire array in storage slot two. What it has actually is just the array length. The length of the array is stored at storage slot two. But for example, if we do my array dot push 222, we do some hashing function, which again, you can see in the documentation what that is, and we'll store the number 222 at that location in storage. The hex of 222 is 0x00000DE. So it gets stored in this crazy spot. And this is good. This is intentional because 32 bytes may not be nearly big enough to store my array if our array gets massive. And it wouldn't make sense for it to put the elements inside the array at subsequent numbers because, again, the size of the array can change and you're never going to be sure how many subsequents that you need. So for my array, it does have a storage slot for the length. For mappings, it does have a storage spot as well, similar to array, but it's just blank. But it's blank intentionally so that Solidity knows, ah, okay, there is a mapping here and it needs a storage slot for its hashing function to work correctly. Now, interestingly, constant variables and immutable variables do not take up spots in storage. 
The reason for this is because constant variables are actually part of the contract's bytecode itself, which sounds a little bit weird, but you can imagine what Solidity does is anytime it sees constant variables name is it just automatically swaps it out with whatever number it actually is. So you can kind of think of not in storage is just a pointer to 123 and it doesn't take up a storage slot. Well, when we have variables inside of a function, those variables only exist for the duration of the function. They don't stay inside the contract. They don't persist. They're not permanent. So variables inside these functions like new var and other var do not get added to storage. They get added in their own memory data structure, which gets deleted after the function has finished running. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why do we need this memory keyword, especially when it comes to strings? We saw before that we had to say string memory. The reason we need it for strings is because strings are technically this dynamically sized array. And we need to tell Solidity, hey, we're, we're gonna do this on the storage location, or we're gonna do it into the memory location where we can just wipe it. Arrays and mappings can take up a lot more space. So Solidity just wants to make sure, okay, where are we working with this? Is it storage? Is it memory? You have to tell me. I need to know if I need to allocate space for it in our storage data structure. And again, everything here you can read in the Solidity documentation. Now in the GitHub repo associated with this course, if you go to SRC, you'll go to example contracts, we have this fun with storage here as well. And if you go to the scripts of this, we have a deploy storage fun as well, which has some functions in here called print storage data and print first array element that you can play with to actually see where in storage these are being located. We're not gonna code these right now and I'm not really gonna go over what these are doing because, oh, and I'm gonna have to change this name here but I definitely recommend trying to run this yourself on Anvil to see what these storage functions actually print out for you. One other thing that's really cool about Foundry, I can actually check my Foundry contract storage a couple different ways. The first one I can do is forge inspect fundme storage layout and enter, and it'll tell me the exact layout of storage that my fundme contract has. Whoa, and it gives me this giant object here. If I scroll up to the top, I can see the storage layout here, we can see that this S address to amount funded actually is in slot zero. If we continue down, we can see S funders is in slot one. We can see S price feed is in slot two. Then we have all this information about types and some other stuff as well. But this part of the top storage is where we can easily see where stuff is being stored. We can see there too that these immutable variables didn't show up in storage, which it makes sense. Minimum constants and immutables don't get stored in storage. They are part of the contract's bytecode. The other way that we can see storage is using cast storage keyword. If I spin up an anvil chain, create a new shell here, and I run forge script script deploy fundme.s.sol dash dash rpc url. Let's use this http slash dash dash private key. Let's use this one right here, paste it in. We're gonna compile, we're gonna deploy. Oops, I forgot to do broadcast. Let's do it again with dash dash broad cast. Let's actually deploy this to our own locally running Anvil chain. Script ran successfully, awesome. Contract address here. What I can now do, I can run cast storage, paste the contract address here and pick a storage slot, for example, two which is the price feed address, and it's gonna give me exactly what's in that storage slot at storage slot index two. Obviously, zero and one are just gonna be empty because those are what? These two arrays, which right now are this mapping and this array, which right now are blank. If you have a connection to Etherscan, you actually don't even need to add an index, and it'll fetch the source from Etherscan and tell you the whole storage layout, but I'm not connected to Etherscan. This will be something that you should try in the future is actually doing cast storage on a live contract and seeing a live contract's storage. So that'll be your homework for later. So this is just a double down that even when you have the private keyword, that doesn't mean your data is private. Everything on the blockchain is public information and anybody can easily read that information off of your or anybody's blockchain. 